in any election, it seems that there are certain things that should happen if you've got a fair election going on. Um, in mathematics, there's generally four what we call fairness criteria um, that it seems like should apply in an election for it to be a good voting system. The first criteria is called the majority criterion. Um, and this is the idea. The majority criterion says that if one, if one person gets more than 50% of the first place votes, then he or she should be the winner. Now, the way these fairness criteria work is it's just if there actually is somebody that has more than 50%, we expect that that person should be the winner because that's over half of the people wanted them as their first place person. That only seems fair. Um, that's called the majority criterion. If there is no candidate that has more than 50% of the win of the first place votes, we don't really care. That's fine. But if there actually is one, then that person should be the winner. If somebody else wins using the election process that you're trying to use, doesn't seem like it's very fair. So majority criterion, if there's somebody with more than 50% of the first place votes, then that person should win. Another criteria that we have is called the Condorcet criterion. And the idea of this one is that if one person is preferred over each of the other people, then that person should be the winner. Uh, we talked about this a little bit when we were looking for the Condorcet candidate. And if you remember, the Condorcet candidate was who we called was the most popular. We did those one-on-one -on -one, um, elections. And if there was somebody that won every single one-on-one -on -one election against all the other candidates, we said that was the Condorcet candidate. And it only seems fair that that particular preferred person should actually win the election. Um, and we saw some cases where that didn't happen. Um, but it seems like that should be the fair thing to happen. And if we had a good voting system, we would like both of these um, different criteria to actually hold. A third fairness criteria, and this may not be one that you think of right away, but it should make sense in terms of, oh yeah, it seems like that should actually happen, is called the monotonicity criterion. The idea for this criterion is that if one person wins the election and then you hold a re-election, and all the ballot changes favor the old winner, then that person should win the re-election. So let's say, for example, that you had um, candidates A, B, C, and D. And let's say that in your first election, candidate A wins. And maybe this isn't really like a second election. Maybe it's just like a, uh, a pre-poll and then the actual vote or something like that. Um, but in, in whatever your this first election is, if you have candidate A winning, and let's say candidate C is losing, then when you do the re-election, let's say everybody that used to vote for candidate C now votes for KA. When you do the re-election, you, you should still expect candidate A to win. And that's what the monotonicity cr criterion says. That if all of your changes, so if you had an original winner and all of the changes favor the old winner, so like A is now getting more votes, then it seems that person should should really win the re-election, probably even by more than they originally did. Only seems fair. Turns out that there's some voting methods that would allow in certain circumstances for a different person to win, which doesn't quite seem fair. Um, the fourth type of um, fairness criteria that we have is called the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion. And basically what this says is that if one person wins the election and a different candidate drops out, then the original candidate should still win the election. So let's say you have, again, candidates A, B, C, and D. If candidate A won and then candidate D dropped out, it still seems like candidate A should win because they were the most popular, right? Well, again, there are some of our fairness criteria or some of our election methods that would have this not happen in certain circumstances. Um, now, again, if you're trying to see if a criteria is violated, first of all, these are only things that should happen if these conditions apply. Notice that all of these say if. If there's nobody in the election that has more than 50% of the votes, we don't care. The criterion is not violated. It just doesn't even apply. So in order for a criterion to be violated, what has to happen is, 
First of all, both conditions have to apply, or the if condition must apply. Let's say that way. If it doesn't apply, the criteria is not violated. To be violated, you have to have the condition, and someone else has to win. So for example, if we were looking at this bottom category, th this bottom example where we had A, B, C, and D, A wins the first election, D drops out, we rerun the election again. If A wins, there's no problem. That's cool. If we run the election again after D drops out and B wins, then we violated the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion. So first of all, you have to have somebody dropping out, and then you have to have somebody different that wins. So both of those things need to happen if the criterion is going to be violated. So at first it has to apply, and then someone else has to win. Then we have the condition where it's violated. So that's kind of the way that that whole little process thing goes. Um, as strange as it may seem, there actually does not exist a method to count votes that's going to guarantee that all these criterion is actually going to hold true in every single case. While they usually hold true, we can actually come up with examples of a single election where using different good ways to calculate the winner causes different people to win. Um, in fact, the example that we were kind of doing throughout all of the videos showed um, how you could justify any of the different four candidates winning um, using, different, using different methods. Um, and so those end up kind of causing some problems. In 1949, the economist Ken Kenneth Arrow actually mathematically demonstrated that it was impossible for a democratic voting method to actually satisfy all of the four fairness criteria. Yes, that does mean what you think it means. It has been proved that if there's more than two choices in an election, so if we have more than two candidates, there does not exist a counting method which is guaranteed to always be fair. It is possible, even though it doesn't happen very often, which is what we're counting on, it is possible that different people can win an election simply based on the method that you're using to choose to count the votes. Um, so keep these criteria in mind when you're counting your votes. Um, pay attention to which criteria are holding and which may fail, um, because these give us some of the benefits and drawbacks of all of our different election methods. Um, so again, there's not really a perfect way. So what do we do? Well, we do the best that we can. Try to choose the voting method that sounds the most fair for the situation at hand and that takes into account as much as, much as we possibly can do to create a winner for the election situation that we're looking at. Uh, anyway, it's an interesting concept. makes for lots of fascinating political debates, and um, especially with uh, with votings and elections coming up here in the not-too-distant future. So watch the news and see if any of these thoughts kind of come up in the way that um, political discussions are happening. All right, uh, get the last couple of problems there a whirl and see if you can identify which one of these different criteria, majority, condorcet, monotonicity, or independence of irrelevant alternatives, applies for the situation that they're describing.